Good afternoon. I am so excited to be here. There's nothing more thrilling than to be able to uh, talk to a room full of homeschool leaders. You guys are the movers and shakers in the homeschool community. And to be able to encourage uh, homeschooling parents that are watching this from around the globe. Uh, I loved that Zan so powerfully set up the case for a biblical worldview because I'm going to take it to the next level. She came down and I was like, I'm real glad you did that because I'm going to like, I'm not going to give you guys any softballs today. If you've heard me speak before, uh, then you know that it is my passion to equip you to engage the culture. And we're going to talk about that today. I want to start by reading a passage out of Judges chapter 2. And as Zan was talking, I'm looking this passage up furiously because I'm thinking that uh, all of God's warnings in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, talking to us about the importance of worldview have been underscored now in the culture today. And we can see what happens when we do not embrace it. This passage is uh, one of the saddest passages in the Bible because remember the Israelites by now, Joshua has just passed away. The Israelites have seen God do amazing things. How many of you have seen God do amazing things? Anybody? Yes. And we've read about the amazing things that God does. But the Bible records that the Israelites forgot. The Bible records that the Israelites failed to teach their children about the amazing things of God and to train their children in righteousness. And I want you to be thinking about this with me for the next several minutes. I want you to be asking yourself the question, how many generations does it take to change the course of the culture? How many generations does it take to change the, the course of the culture? Listen to this in Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 10. After that generation died, so we, remember I told you Joshua just passed away. After that generation died, another generation grew up after them who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty deeds that he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord their God, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people all around them. How many of you guys are noticing that that's what's happening with our kids in the culture today? And they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel, and so he handed them over to the raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around and they were no longer able to resist them. When God teaches us that we are to pass on the truth of his word to the next generation, we need to listen. Discipleship is important to the Lord. God is serious about discipleship. And if God is serious about discipleship, men and women, we need to be serious about discipleship. If it breaks God's heart, it should break the heart of God's people. If God says, train up your children in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it, we need to remember that the door swings both ways. If we're not training our children up in the way that they should go, if we're sending our children to men and women to educate them who do not know the Lord, then we can be almost assured that our children will rise up and they will walk in the way that they've been taught. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the culture today because I want you to understand two things. First of all, it's a privilege to be able to influence the next generation. Every single person that's sitting in this room, every person that's watching today on the internet, we have been given something precious by the Lord, and that is influence over the next generation. And I believe it only takes one generation to lose the course of the culture, one generation to change the course of the culture. And we are living in an increasingly post-truth climate. Right now what we're seeing happen, because we've seen generations fail to teach our children about the ways of the Lord, we're watching a generation who no longer embraces truth. Truth has become relative in the culture. This is why we're seeing a sharp decline in our ability to reason with the generation. Sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I speak for a living and I travel around the nation and sometimes around the world talking to audiences. And what I'm hearing increasingly is a frustration from parents who are saying we're unable to reason with the generation things that seem logical and right to us. But that's because we have abandoned truth. And we know that truth isn't an idea. Truth is in the person of Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we need to be teaching our children what it looks like. Today's kids are asking tough questions. How many of you guys have noticed that? 
I've been a parent for a long time now, and it's fascinating to me. Uh, years ago, I wrote a book, several years ago, I wrote a book called Becoming Mom Strong. And the point of that book was to say that our children today are asking questions that my generation didn't even see coming. We had no idea that our kids were gonna be saying, are, are male and female, is it a malleable construct? Is gender a social construct? I laughed at that idea when I heard about it 12 years ago. I remember telling my husband, that will never take root in the culture. And here we are. It's definitely taking root in the culture. And tough questions require tough answers. And I'm gonna encourage you today because I believe with all my heart that exactly what Zan said is true. It is time for us to be able to engage the culture. And we need to engage the culture from a position of, of faith and not of fear. And we need to engage the culture from a position of authority. That authority comes from the Lord of Heaven's armies. That authority comes from the Word of God. And so when we know the Word, we are able then to pass that on to our children. Parents, listen to me carefully. You can't pass on what you don't possess. You can't pass on what you don't possess. And I keep hearing parents say, I want my, my kids to be world changers. I want my kids to get out there and be strong for the gospel, but they're not doing it at home. And so if you want your children to be strong in the Lord, let them see you studying God's word. If you want your children to have a vibrant prayer life, mom and dad, let them find you on your knees in prayer. Let them see that it matters to you. The Bible teaches us in 1 Peter that we have an adversary. Anytime you see an image in scripture, pay close attention. There are images all over scripture, illustrations where the authors of the Bible are teaching us about the spiritual battle that we're in. We recognize that it's not a battle against people, right? I think this is a really important distinction because we're gonna be talking a lot about some difficult issues in the next several minutes. And so I like to set the stage by saying, this is not a battle against human beings. This is a battle against ideologies that come from the enemy, from the adversary of our soul. The Bible says, be on the alert. You have an adversary and his name is Satan and he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Something I think is so interesting. First of all, we learn that this is war. And we would never, if we knew that there was a lion outside of our homes, we would never just send our children out onto the battlefield, would we? No, we would teach our children how to identify the adversary. We would say, if you see the grass lying at this particular angle, you'll know that the adversary's been there. This is, how you, this is how you discover where the footprints of the adversary has been. This is where you recognize the, the smell of the breath of the adversary. Even if you can't see him, you go, ooh, something's wrong. Because your spirit has been trained by the word of God and the authority of God's word to be discerning. Spurgeon said that discernment is not the difference between right and wrong. It is the difference between right and almost right. And this is what we're struggling with in the culture right now. We have a biblically illiterate church who does not know God's word and can't defend it. And so when Zan talks about knowing the word of God, we remember that when God said, you've got to know my word and pass it on to your children, it's because he's saying, if you don't do that, suffering will be the sure result. I've been keeping track now for several years of the headlines as we see them in the culture today. This one's from last uh, January, a couple of years ago, talking to youth pastors, said, get ready, youth group leaders. Teens today are twice as likely to identify as atheist or LGBT. I can tell you right now that there is a battle that is happening. I have been uh, privileged to speak now for many years. I have my own women's conference called Faith That Speaks. And I am bringing that conference to many parts of the United States. And I was scheduled to bring it to Virginia. And I was speaking in Houston this Saturday. And before that, I was in Dallas. And I won't, I'm, think I'm going home tonight. I hope I'm going home tonight. <laughs> and I was in Houston on Saturday. And about noon, I had a lunch break. And my assistant called. And she said, your event in Virginia has been canceled. And it was shocking to me because I'm speaking at a church. I'm, I'm addressing believers about what's happening in the culture. Remember what I said earlier, this is not about people. God loves people. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because his heart is that none of us would perish, but we have been entrusted with the truth of God's word, right? And so what happened was that there was a group, an LGBT group that went to this church's website and they began to post bad reviews on the website using the, the typical language of the day, right? We know the language, right? You've got some sort of a phobia if you believe that what God says about human sexuality is actually true. Five bad reviews on the church's website and 24 hours later, my event was canceled. 
I want to just encourage you right now to remember that the battle you are facing is a serious battle and the adversary is playing for keeps. He's not messing around. What's happening in the culture today will require men and women of valor and men and women of courage. The Bible teaches us no less than 27 times in the scriptures that we are to be both strong and courageous. What's happening in the culture has been a brainwashing that we have seen, ha we have seen coming now for many years. I saw this article, thought it was so interesting, the sinister side of the gender war. Listen to this from the article, but it's just a phase. How many parents have made that same desperate plea to a teacher or a counselor or a doctor? Deep down, they know their children weren't born in the wrong body. They know the confusion about their child's identity is coming from somewhere else, a struggle that doesn't have to be permanent. But in a culture that's determined to indulge this fantasy at any cost, who would believe them? These are real life stories of parents who are going through this. You guys may be watching me on the front lines of the fight against comprehensive sex education in the schools. And a lot of parents have said to me, Heidi, why do you care about that? Your kids are, in, in, or your kids are homeschooled. Parents, you need to care about what's happening in the public schools. Whether or not you are homeschooling is irrelevant to the damage that is being done to our children in the name of being woke and being ahead of the curve. The story goes on to say, their stories from parents are real life nightmares. On a panel about gender ideology at the Heritage Foundation, attorneys shared one, attorneys shared one heart wrenching testimony after another. Jennifer Chavez, a liberal with liberal clients, explained that she may disagree with conservatives on abortion or taxes, but the transgender movement is a place where every American can come together. Why? Because this ideology is no respecter of persons. It will haunt families and rob futures on both sides. Why is the ideology so damaging? and Why do you need to care about it? Because it is an attack against the very nature of God's creation. Because God said in his word, in the beginning, I created you male and female. And what we're seeing here is absolutely an attack on the family. This is a spiritual battle that we're in. Recently, California has implemented sex ed curriculum that is absolutely heartbreaking. And Washington State is not far behind them. I had friends, I was sick a couple weeks ago, I was supposed to testify at a committee in Olympia, and my friends told me that the education committee, the, uh, the person who was running that committee gaveled down in the middle of testimony from parents who were weeping over what is happening to their children, gaveled down, called the meeting off, and left the room without the parents ever being able to finish their testimony. Men and women, you need to understand that the battle you are facing is a spiritual battle and you need to engage in it. And if you can't come at it, if your children can't come at it from a biblical worldview, we're going to see headlines like this continue. This was just recently, January 30th, 2020. This happened in my neck of the woods. Monica Stonier comes from my city in Vancouver, Washington. And this is her, she's, um, this was the question, can a man get pregnant? Well, we all 15 years ago, we'd have laughed at that. It's not funny anymore. This was her answer. It depends. You guys, we are doing irreparable harm to our children because we have refused to engage the world from a biblical perspective. It absolutely matters. And the headlines that we see over and over and over again should alarm us, but they should not frighten us because we are children of the living God. You are not who the world says you are. You are who God says you are. God has defined you from the beginning of time, and I want to continue to encourage you. This is amazing to me. Barna has been... Uh, releasing studies now for many years. And it's fascinating to me to sort of watch what's happening in the culture. You can kind of see the difference between Gen Z and uh, the elders and the boomers. Lying is morally wrong. 34% of Gen Z would tell you that lying is morally wrong. 34%, why? Because our morals come from God's word. Zam set it up perfectly. When you walk away from the truth of God's word, uh, lies fill the vacuum. And we have a responsibility to this generation of believers to fill the vacuum in the culture with truth. And truth is found in the, in the work and person of Jesus Christ. And we know this because his word teaches us that it's so. Another study that was recently uh, released talks about how uh, Gen Z is a very emotional generation. To them, the right beliefs are the ones that don't hurt anybody. And these young Americans have come of age in an incredibly complex world. They have access to more information than any other generation before them, any generation in human history. And they are also the most diverse generation in human history. But as Jay and I have been teaching our children, your level of comfort 
with the truth does not make truth or dismake it. Truth is truth. It is an absolute. Truth is like gravity. And yet what we're noticing in the culture, this is particularly true where Jay and I come from in the Pacific Northwest, where we've been seeing this happen now for, for many years. What we're noticing is that truth is in the crosshairs and Christians need to know the truth exists and we need to learn to defend it. And men and women, it starts at home. So I want to give you five commitments that will advance a biblical worldview and ask you to think about these things and what are we doing in our churches today to advance a biblical worldview. One of the things I love about being here this weekend is the commitment that Bob Jones University Press has to making sure children are grounded in the truth in every subject. I was very privileged as a young girl. My grandparents uh, believed in Christian education. And my grandparents knew that my parents could not afford to send us to a Christian school, and so they used their savings to send me and my siblings to a Christian school. And I remember being in high school and I, you know, uh, in Algebra 2. I don't know how I got to Algebra 2, but I remember that I didn't do well in it. And uh, I remember my teacher, Mr. Zimmerman, if you're watching today, thank you so much, I get it now. I remember my teacher, Mr. Zimmerman, teaching us huge passages in Romans. And I kept thinking, for goodness sake, Algebra 2 was hard enough. Why do I have to memorize huge passages of Romans? I understand now because he was trying to teach us that God was saying in his word, I am a God of order. And math is order. And even though we didn't understand it, parents, your kids may not understand why you're infusing every single subject with worldview and with a perspective of biblical reality, but one day they will. One day they will. So keep doing it. So the first commitment is a commitment to truth. I think this is so interesting. For its April 8th, 1966 issue, Time Magazine put, Is God Dead? on the cover. 1966, Time Magazine is asking, Is God Dead? And in 2017, they asked, Is truth dead? Why are they asking these questions? Because we are living in a culture in moral and spiritual decline. And they can see it, but they don't understand it. As God's children, we have access to understanding. We can understand what's happening. What we want to teach our children is that truth always trumps emotion. Your truth, truth is not determined by how we feel about this. John Piper said, my feelings are not God. God is God. My feelings do not define truth. God's word defines truth. And our children need to know that truth is absolute and it always overrides our unpredictable, undependable emotions. We teach our children that truth exists and that they can find it and that they have access to it. It's important for our children to understand that God defines truth. And once you understand that, it's amazing to me the foundations. I said to, my, to one of my children the other day, we were talking about, I love history, we were talking about history. And we studied the greatest generation and, and uh, my kids are always talking to me about little things that we will discuss over dinner. And I said to one of my kids, I said, you, you know, we, we've been talking about the dumbest, they're this, the greatest generation. And they said, yeah. I said, I think this might be the dumbest generation. And my daughter said, that's offensive. <laughs> and I said, you're right. That is offensive. So let me, let, me, uh, let me back up a little bit. Because I realized in my frustration, I said something that I didn't really mean. Because what is going on is, it's not, it's not a stupidity. It is a blindness. It is because we have allowed the culture to be shrouded with lies. And the only antidote to the bold lies in the culture right now is bold truth. You should write that down. <laughs> the only answer, the antidote to a bold lie is bold truth. Several years ago, I was flying home on Delta, and uh, they, there was an article in Delta uh, Sky Magazine. And it was called, The Toys They Are A-Changin'. And it was about six pages dedicated to the fact that uh, many toy makers in the United States, starting with uh, the massive retailer Target, have decided that toys should no longer reflect the gender of children. And so they're making, you know, purple dinosaurs, and they're making, uh, Mattel has come out now with Barbie dolls that are gender neutral, very confusing toys for children. And they're going through the litany of reasons why gender is a social construct, and there are 72 genders, and our kids have, gen their gender is fluid, and their, their gender is something they think about. And so as I think, therefore I am. And as I was reading, the, I was sitting in the back, you know, God's doing a sanctifying work in my life through the, through the process of airline travel. And I spent about eight years in the back of airplanes on Delta in the middle seat, you know, with people falling asleep on me and drooling on me. So I'm already upset. 
And I'm reading this article and it's making me even more upset as I'm reading it because I just wanted to stand up and say, no, 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 this is wrong. And I'm realizing there are 300 people on this airplane likely reading the same article and half of those people are like, yeah, you right. And so I got home and I wrote this article called The Lie of Gender Neutrality, Why I'm Telling My Children the Truth About Their DNA. And I published it on my blog and I thought, people will love this. They'll be so encouraged. But I was wrong. Instead, there was a tremendous backlash from people telling me that I didn't understand that society had changed and th people had evolved and were different now. But the Bible teaches us that though the culture may evolve, God's word never will. The truth of God's word remains the same, right? Isaiah tells us that the grass will wither and the flower will fade, but how long will God's word stand, men and women? Forever. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to side with the unchanging, forever standing, living, breathing, active word of God. In Job 28, it says, God alone understands the way to wisdom. He knows where it can be found, for he looks throughout the whole earth and sees everything under the heavens. He decided how hard the wind should blow and how much rain should fall, Pacific Northwest. He made the laws for the rain and laid out the path for the lightning. He saw wisdom and evaluated it. He sat in the high place and examined it thoroughly, and this is what he says to all humanity. Listen up. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is true understanding. This is the way that we need to teach our children to walk in. The Bible teaches us that truth is unchanging. Check this out. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. James 1, 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Psalm 55. God will hear and answer them, even the one who sits enthroned from of old, with whom there is no change. We need to teach our children to, to a walk in the ways of the one who does not change. And I don't know about you, but the more the world changes around me, the more comfort I find in the fact that I'm not going to wake up next Thursday morning and God will have changed his mind. I'm not going to stake my life on, an, on, on the values that I read in God's word and listening to the Holy Spirit and someday find out that I was wrong and I took my whole family down the wrong direction because God said that will never happen. And when God says something, men and women, you can take it to the bank. The next tool that we need to have in our, tool, in our toolbox is a commitment to studying God's word. I love that Zan pointed this out so beautifully because it is truth that every single one of us needs to know. Remember I said a few minutes ago that one of the, the huge problems we're having in the culture right now is we are living in a biblically illiterate church. We're more concerned with getting people in through seeker sensitive uh, churches and we're really big into our music and we love our fog machines and we get them in with all this great stuff and then we don't disciple them. And so when the, tough stuff, when, the, when the tough questions come at them, they don't know God's word and they can't defend it. Men and women, this starts at home. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but it's not the job of your pastor or youth pastor to disciple your children. It's your job. God gives that responsibility first to parents. And he says, this is the way. Walk in it. You walk in it first. And then you teach your children to walk in it. Listen to this out, out of Matthew 22. I love this. Jesus talking to them. Jesus replied, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. This is Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. I've been stunned as I've watched what's been happening in the church. And, and the reason why uh, I founded Mom Strong International two and a half years ago is because I am woefully afraid of what is happening in our churches, particularly when it comes to our ministry to mothers. We're getting together and we're making crafts and talking about what a hot mess we are and how long and how hard marriage is. And boy, motherhood sure is hard. And then we're going home. And I'm like, why aren't we using our time to study the word of God, to open up his word, to understand it, to pray, Father, give me wisdom and discernment. The world around us is so messed up. And Lord, we can't do this without you. It matters. Remember I talked about a few minutes ago this, this lie of gender identity? We know that it started in the Garden of Eden because the adversary has been after the identity of God's people since the beginning of time. And he saw Eve in the garden and he lied to her. Do you guys remember this? He lied to her. I love this image because I so see my beautiful daughter in this, in this uh, image of this young girl. And the innocence with which she's looking at the snake and she's like, well, I don't know. Maybe he has a point. <coughs> And he leans into this beautiful young woman and he says, you won't surely die. You're not going to die. Hey, hey, 
lean in. You're going to be like God. This is what's happening in the culture right now. The adversary whispers into the hearts and minds of our children, you won't die. And men and women, if we're not there to set them straight, if we don't understand what we're up against, this is going to continue and continue and continue. And God has called this generation to stand in the gap for these kids. I believe with all my heart, because I believe the word of God in their entirety from Genesis to Revelation that you were literally born for this time. God's not looking down from heaven and going, man, this is, I did, did not see that coming. Wow, I just had no idea that was going to happen. No, he knew it was going to happen before the foundations of the earth, and he appointed you to be here right now to address it. The question is not, should you be here? The question is, what are you going to do now that you're here and you see what's going on around you? I've been encouraging a generation of parents now for about 15 years to study their adversary to know the enemy. Listen, men and women, you need to know your adversary. You need to understand what you're up against. And like we're always telling our kids, you got to know who your adversary is. You got to study his tactics and know what he's like. And believe me when I say, if you're not studying him, he is studying you. He knows our weak spot. Something I find so interesting about the phenomenon in our culture right now known as gender dysphoria is a very simple fact. And that is this. Most of the children that we see being diagnosed with gender dysphoria are children with autism, children with mental and spiritual uh, issues that are not being addressed by the church. And so the adversary sees a weakness and he comes and he goes, he's going right for the jugular. A couple of years ago, I was privileged to give the keynote address for uh, Indiana homeschoolers. And I felt pretty good about it because I thought I'd be in the heartland and what could possibly go wrong. <laughs> and I began by talking with them about what's happening in the culture. And I started saying that transgenderism meets the clinical definition of delusion, and it does. A delusion is when I look at something and I see it one way, but reality is something different. My perception and reality don't match up. In the culture, we see anorexia as a delusion. A woman who is 85 pounds in reality looks in a mirror and sees herself as 300 pounds and decides not to eat anymore. The difference between gender dysphoria and anorexia is the culture has not decided to lie to the woman with anorexia. We're telling her the truth. And sometimes we're force feeding her. Are we not? Why? Because we know that if she doesn't eat, what will happen? She'll die. Men and women, our children are dying around us. Where is the church? When will we address this in real time? And so I'm speaking, and, I, and as I'm speaking, I'm looking at Tara because she was there. You're still, she has post-traumatic stress disorder from this. It's all right. We'll be okay. <laughs> as I'm speaking about this and calling it illusion, a delusion, a woman is about maybe 17 rows back in the middle of thousands of people sitting in, this, in, in an audience, begins to storm the front of the stage, and she's raising her fist, and she says, give me your microphone. You guys, as I live and breathe, there was a spirit on this woman. She said, give me your microphone. I said, no, it's not your turn to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a long story, but she, it, it felt like 20 minutes to me, but I'm sure it wasn't more than a couple of minutes. And I finally said to her, listen, in the name of Jesus, I need you to sit down. And if you're willing, I will talk to you when this is over. And so they brought her back behind the stage. I love the men and women of the uh, Indianapolis Convention because I could see all these men around. I could see their feet through the curtains, you know. They were like, we got you. You know, you're good. Because for a second there, I thought, I'm going to die in Indiana. <laughs> and I asked this woman, what is wrong? Why? Because you can, you can see that her heart was breaking. And she said, my son has been in the Indianapolis public school system since he was in kindergarten, and he's in second grade. And in kindergarten, they started introducing our kids to the idea of, of different genders. And now he's in, he's in the second grade, and two of his friends, two of his best friends, little boys, have decided, because they're being indoctrinated and lied to by the adversary of her souls, who is using the school system to do it, and those kids are starting to transition. Little, tiny children, our hearts should break for this. We should be at every school board meeting fighting this with everything that we have inside of us because these kids matter to the Lord of Heaven's armies. They should matter to us. And as she stood there talking to me, my heart broke for her because the pain is so visceral. And like I told you before, and it's so important to remember, this is not against people. This is against the adversary of your soul. Don't lose sight of who the battle is for and who is waging the battle. Know your adversary. Study his word. 
The next tool is a commitment to courage. One of the things that was most frustrating to me on Saturday when the church, by the way, if anyone has a church in Virginia, I'm churchless now. <laughs> I need a venue. That's free. Thank you, Zam. One of the things that was so frustrating to me and so discouraging to me about my event being canceled in Virginia was that no one called me to let me talk about what I wanted to talk about. Instead, they let a group of probably three men at home on their laptops in women's clothing scare them into canceling an event. It took less than 24 hours for the men and women who should have the courage of the living God, the Lion of Judah, who would defend them to fold and, and put a public announcement on their Facebook page saying that they didn't know the woman who was coming and didn't, didn't stand for what I stood for. And my heart broke because I stand for the living God and for the truth of his word. And in the culture today, that will cost you something. It will. Following God requires courage. Christian courage is the willingness to say and do the right thing regardless of earthly cost, because we know that God promises to help us. He said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never, and I'll never forsake you. And when God makes a promise, men and women, you can count on it. God teaches us that we are to teach truth with love. This is something the church has struggled to do in past generations, and we got to get it right. When we look at how Jesus did it, Jesus, Jesus was able to do it. When we see it's just grace, right? This is a seeker-sensitive church who's saying, oh, it doesn't really matter. God doesn't really care about this. He doesn't really care about that, except for God's clear instructions throughout the word would suggest otherwise. So all of this grace, my husband so rightly calls it sloppy agape, all of this grace, which doesn't take into account the truth of God's word, or you've got truth over here and no love at all. Both of those are not Jesus. That's not how he spoke to people. That wasn't what his ministry was about. This is, this is tough, you guys. This is, this is hard. Listen, we are called to live in the tension between truth and grace. Live in the tension to be able to have the hard conversations, to be able to say, boy, this isn't right, but I tell you what, you are so loved. My grandmother used to say, Heidi, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. But she never failed to discipline me when I needed it. And she never failed to tell me the truth of God's word. And my grandmother's prayers are a huge part of the reason why I'm standing up here today. Walking in the culture today requires that we learn to speak the truth in love. Truth without love is brutality, but love without truth is a lie. And we see this often in the culture right now. The next thing that we need is a commitment to teaching every subject from a biblical perspective. Men and women, education is not neutral. If you're sitting in this room today, my hunch is that you've already figured that out. But it's a message that needs to go out loud and clear to the church. It's a message that our pastors need to be speaking from the pulpits every opportunity that they get. To be able to say that education has not ever been, nor will it ever be, neutral. And to teach our children that God is in everything. I love that Zan put up the 12 disciplines because I'm telling you what, you, we can see the fingerprints of God, can't we? When we start actually thinking about it, we can see the fingerprints of God in all of them. And we can also see what happens when we remove God. Men and women, what happens when we remove God from music? What happens when we remove God from the Super Bowl? Did anybody watch the halftime show? I didn't watch it, but I got pictures on my phone because people from the blog kept sending them to me, and I was horrified. This is what happens when we say that God isn't in sports and he doesn't care about it. When you remove God from the equation, when you remove truth from the equation, f uh, lies will always fill the vacuum. And I began to pray. I told my husband, I'm like, we need to pray for godly men and women in the NFL. Godly men, and we need to pray for godly men and women to come work for Pepsi. Because it matters. Teaching our children, I, I think it's, I find it so interesting. When I was growing up in the 70s, and my parents, I, I grew up in a Christian home, but my parents were really struggling. My parents had a very unhappy marriage. They were, I was 18 years old when my parents divorced. I grew up in a very unhappy home, a very dysfunctional home. And I remember watching my parents trying to navigate the world, one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and it doesn't work. 
Jesus said, be hot or be cold. What does it look like? He said, be holy as I am holy. We never talk about holiness in the church because that's such a boring subject. You know what holiness means? It means to be set apart. I want to ask you today, are you set apart? Are you teaching your children to be set apart? Are you teaching them to engage the culture? Don't be afraid to talk to your kids about what's happening in the culture. Our nine-year-old was only five, four and a half, almost five. When a cover uh, came out on Vogue magazine, some of you will remember it, of Bruce Jenner. Do you remember this cover on Vogue magazine? Be, all you had to do was go to Walmart, which, you know, homeschoolers, we frequent that place. And I'm at the checkout stand, right? And I've got a, a bunch of my kids are with me, and I'm telling them, don't take the candy off of the, off of, that's like the tree in the garden, you know, don't touch. <laughs> because that, you, uh, you will surely die. No, I didn't actually say that, but you understand. So... I'm, I'm trying to unload the, the, the groceries out of the cart, and my kids are helping me put things on the conveyor belt. And I look down, and my daughter, my little four-year-old daughter, is staring at this magazine, and she's eye-level with it. And here is this grown man in a corset. And she starts pulling on my shirt. I'm like, I don't want to talk about it right now. <laughs> and she said, Mama, Mama. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, talk to her right now. And so I said, what is it, honey? And she said, why, why is that man dressed like a princess? You see, our children instinctively know that something is wrong. It is the adults in the, in, the, in the world today that are lying to the children. It really is. And so I kind of got down eye level with her. And I said, sweetheart, did God make you a boy or a girl? She said, well, he made me a girl. I said, you know, some people are really confused. I said, some people don't know how much God loves them. And he loves that man just the way he made him. And he loves you just the way that he made him. And she said, well, someone should tell him. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Someone should tell him. Jesus said, to go and make disciples of all the world. He said that we are the ones who steward truth. It is up to this generation to be the ambassadors that God calls us to be. And so truth, tool number five is a commitment to personal integrity. Something that I am ashamed to say is sorely lacking in the church today. A commitment to personal integrity, that means that I'm reading the word of God and I'm doing what God asked me to do when no one else is watching. In the quiet places of my heart. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It means a change of mind. It means I change my mind. It means I see that I'm going this direction and I'm wrong. And I'm going to turn around and go this direction. Some of you listening to this today are going the wrong direction. Some of you recognize that there's problems in the culture, but you're too afraid to address it. Or you feel ill-equipped. Or you feel afraid. And we know because Paul said to Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, power and love and a sound mind. These are the marks of a mature Christian, someone who walks with the Lord. I also love that he said, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. And in my mind, several years ago, as I was studying this passage with our kids, it hit me. Oh my goodness, fear is a spirit. It's a spirit. And we know it's not from the Lord. Now, there are good things to be afraid of, right? There are reasons for a holy fear, right? We have a fear. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? wisdom. We got universities right now with tons and tons of kids on them who have a ton of knowledge and no wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to take the things that, that we've learned and the things that our children are learning and to apply them from a biblical worldview and to make wise and good and godly decisions. God said, that's what you want. Some of you are focusing so much on academics that you're failing to disciple your children. And I'm here to tell you right now, if the only thing that you ever did with your children is instruct them in the word of God, if that's what God told you to do, God would do the rest. God will finish in your children what he's begun in them through you. Your job is to disciple them and train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I think it's important to say, too, that we know that it's not too late. I believe, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with Zan. I believe the homeschooling movement is a revival movement. If you'd asked me that 20 years ago, I'd have been like, no, homeschooling is just for moms who are a little on the offside. <laughs> and now I see that God's been at work in the homeschool movement. And we know that victory begins at home. It begins at home. 
It begins with a mom and a dad totally committed to walking in right relationship with the Lord. That means we walk in humility. That means we say that we're sorry to our kids. I don't know about you guys, but homeschooling, mothering, actually even being a grandmother for me is a sanctifying thing. How many of you guys have had your kids push you to the absolute limit and something came out of your mouth that you were like, right? A few of you honest people. The rest of you are just liars. That's a sin too. Because parenting is sanctifying. And God is making us more into his, making us into his image as we realize how broken we are and how in need of a savior we are. And you guys, homeschooling is not the answer. I've been telling audiences this for 15 years. We stand under the banner of homeschooling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to urge you today to put down the banner of homeschooling and lift up the banner of Jesus. We want our children to walk with the living God. Homeschooling is not the answer, but it's an amazing opportunity for discipleship. It is the best opportunity that parents have right now in the culture to train their children in righteousness, to use every moment that God gives you to teach your children truth, to infuse them with truth in every area of their lives so that when they get out into the world, they'll know God's word and be able to stand on it and their lives will flourish like the cedars of Lebanon. Isn't that what we want? It absolutely is. And if that's what we want, then we know that we want to align with God's word and believe God when he says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. This is my way, walk in it. And that gives me encouragement. Wherever you are today, whatever it is that God is doing in your life, start today. If you realize, oh man, I gotta go back to the discipleship piece, metanoia, I changed my mind. I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna focus on the things that really matter and trust that God will do the rest, amen? He will. He's good like that. Thank you very much.